Hello again, folks. We're going to talk here about first trimester bleeding and miscarriage. Very, very, very important topic, possibly the most important topic when it comes to OB uh, on your exam, uh, because this is very common and it's very important that you recognize this stuff because you can run into this in the clinic, you can run into this in the ER. You do not need to be an OBGYN to see this. Um, you will see it as a primary doc, so uh, very important stuff here. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get uh, to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. I appreciate it very much. Okay, so about 25% of pregnancies will have bleeding in the first trimester. That is a lot. That is a lot. A lot of women don't know this. Um, a lot of men don't know this. Um, a lot of doctors don't know this. So you have a woman who's bleeding in the first trimester and she's going to come in and she's going to be very distraught. And the first thing you need to do is to reassure her that half of the time this bleeding will go away and you will have a normal pregnancy. Now, half of the time, unfortunately, you won't and you will have a pregnancy loss. So uh, for that reason, pain and heavy bleeding are associated with an increased risk of pregnancy loss, but it doesn't mean that you will lose the pregnancy. The vast majority of pregnancy losses are due to chromosomal anomalies, and this is a very common question on exams. So you get a vignette with a woman who has a miscarriage, and they ask what's the most likely cause. And the most likely cause is that the embryo just did not get the right array of chromosomes, you know, trisomies, monosomies, it happens. It's very common. Now, there is a big differential for first trimester bleeding, and um, the ones that you should be thinking of are pregnancy losses. Now, threatened abortion, about 50% of these go on to be a normal pregnancy. The other 50% will go on to be a miscarriage. And there are a variety of different kinds of miscarriages, also known as spontaneous abortion. So you'll hear the word abortion thrown around. This, these are all spontaneous abortions. Now there's one more that I didn't put here, and that is a missed abortion. We'll talk about what that is. It's very important that you understand inevitable, incomplete, complete, and missed, along with threatened. And then there's uh, ectopic pregnancies, molar pregnancies, and very importantly, non-OB causes. So she might have bleeding just because she's got some trauma to her genitals. Um, you know, rough sex can do it. Um, so we want to look for trauma. And then we also want to consider the possibility of a cervical polyp. Those can bleed too. All right, this is just some in uh, interesting information that I found. You can read up on this if you want. So what do we do for a workup? Always start with the physical exam. So you want to rule out trauma, and you can do this by just an inspection of the external genitalia. Uh, and then you want to do a bimanual exam, feeling for masses. And then very importantly, to do a speculum examination because you want to ex evaluate the cervix. If the cervix is open, you can be pretty sure that she is having a miscarriage. Um, now, the next thing that we need to do as far as labs is to get a quantitative beta HCG. Do not answer qualitative. Qualitative will, will just tell you yes or no. Is she pregnant? Quantitative will give you an idea of how the pregnancy is coming along in the first trimester. So you want to be able to compare this to past and future measurements. So get the quantitative beta HCG. Of course, if she's bleeding, we always want to get a CBC, and then we need to visualize the pregnancy, and in the first trimester, that is done with a transvaginal ultrasound. And this will help you determine if the fetus is viable, which is usually determined by looking at fetal heart motion, and it'll also help you determine whether you have an ectopic pregnancy. A big hint for an ectopic pregnancy is having a positive pregnancy test with no evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy. Okay, so what is this threatened abortion? A threatened abortion is where you have, you're pregnant and you're bleeding, but pretty much everything else is normal. The os is closed, um, there's no passage of products of conception, and there's no evidence of fetal demise. So when you do your ultrasound, the, the fetus is alive. So you just have bleeding. That's a threatened abortion, okay? Half of these 
threatened abortions do go on to miscarriage, and the other half will go on to be a normal pregnancy. Then we have all these different types of miscarriages. So half will go on to be miscarriage, and we have all these different types. And you can look at this and read this, but I am going to draw this out for you. Okay, so as I mentioned, the first thing that we do when you've got a woman coming in with bleeding is the speculum exam. So you do, it's part of your physical exam. So what do we look for? We look at the os. Okay, we're looking at the cervical os. Now let's say that the os is closed. Okay, you have a closed os. Well, the next thing we do, of course, is we look at our transvaginal ultrasound. Now, the transvaginal ultrasound will tell us if the fetus is viable or not. Now, if the fetus is viable, if you detect heart motion, then what you have here is a threatened abortion. Okay, fetus is alive, os is closed, everything is fine. 50% of these will go on to be normal, and the other 50% will progress to miscarriage. Now, if the fetus is not viable, you get no heart motion or anything, but the os is closed... I'm just going to put non-viable here. Uh, uh, so if the os is closed and the fetus is dead, then what you have here is a missed abortion. Okay? Now let's say the os is open. You have bleeding and an open os. Um, so what now you have for sure is a spontaneous abortion, but what kind? Well, now, again, we're going to look at the transvaginal ultrasound, but now the question is not so much is the fetus alive, but how much tissue remains. So if all of the tissue remains, then what you're dealing with is an inevitable abortion. If some remains, then what you have is an incomplete abortion. And if none of it remains, if the uterus is empty, uh, then you have a complete abortion. Now, as we're going to see, um, the missed abortion, inevitable abortion, and incomplete abortion are all managed the same way. However, if any of these patients begin to have very heavy bleeding when we're observing them, if we're doing expectant management, then you need to uh, manage these patients surgically, okay? Now, all of these patients are going to get Rogam, and that's going to be an important part of management as we're going to see. Now, an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy where the embryo implants somewhere other than the uterus. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of these are going to be in the fallopian tubes, particularly the ampulla. Uh, there are a number of manifestations. Um, it's typically vaginal bleeding. They may describe it to you as amenorrhea, especially if she didn't know she was pregnant. Um, but usually what you have here is a positive pregnancy test. You go to visualize the fetus and you see nothing. You see no intrauterine pregnancy. Um, now, there are a number of other symptoms because these ectopic pregnancies can rupture. So this can vary from anything to a little bit of bleeding, or maybe you don't even have that. Maybe you have a positive pregnancy test and you go and do ultrasound, you don't see anything. And it can go from that all the way to an acute abdomen and death. So this is a wide uh, range. Where you really need to keep your eye out for this is when you have a positive pregnancy test and an ultrasound that shows no intrauterine pregnancy, then you really need to think ectopic. Ectopic pregnancy should always be on your differential for any woman of reproductive age coming in with lower abdominal pain. This is why we always get a, quanti or a qualitative beta HCG on a woman coming in with abdominal pain. Now, when you diagnose a woman with any kind of, uh, of first trimester bleeding or amenorrhea plus bleeding, uh, you need to establish the RH status. This is part of our typical uh, laboratory battery that we do on any woman who's coming in to establish a diagnosis of pregnancy. You've got to know that RH status because that will dictate whether we need to give her uh, Rogam or not. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about the management of ectopic pregnancy because there's so much disagreement of when to do conservative management, when to do medical management, when to do surgical management. What I will point out for you are two very important things that you will be responsible for. Number one, 
Medical management is with methotrexate. Methotrexate, okay? Surgical management should be done if there is any sign of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, if there are contraindications to methotrexate, or most importantly, if the woman is unstable. Then you go for surgical management. You got to get this done now. All right. Now, when you have a woman who uh, has management for an ectopic pregnancy and you're taking care of it, you've got to follow the, her beta HCG levels out until they normalize. These are some of the contraindications to methotrexate. So um, you can look at those if you want. Now, a molar pregnancy is an abnormal pregnancy that results from chromosomal irregularities. Um, so this can happen in a number of ways. Um, the mechanism is not super important. What's more important is that you understand how these tend to present. A number one, molar pregnancies always have very high beta HCG levels. So what that means is that you're going to have an increased amount of nausea and vomiting because that is what's behind morning sickness. And another thing that we tend to see is an abnormal uterus size. Now, if this is a complete molar pregnancy, it will tend to be large for gestational age. And if it's a partial molar pregnancy, it'll tend to be small. Okay, so what are what's the difference between these two? Well, a complete hydatidiform mole uh, results from a uniparental disomy. So typically the way that this happens is that you have an empty egg and you are, um, the, the egg is fertilized by either two sperm or it's fertilized by one sperm and then that genome duplicates. Either way, you get uniparental disomy. So what happens is you've got your array of 46 chromosomes, but they both come from dad and that's incompatible with life. So um, the way that this typically manifests is that if you were to do a sonogram, you would see prominent villi in this snowstorm pattern. Another thing that can happen from this is that you can get expulsion of those prominent hydropic villi, and they look like grapes. So you may hear that. Now, a partial hydatidiform mole is due to triploidy. So what happens here is that you have a normal egg that happens to get fertilized by two sperm. So now you have... 69 chromosomes. So that's triploidy. What you can see here is what looks like a fetus, but it is definitely not alive. Um, it just looks like it. Um, so you may see a fetal pole. So for this reason, this is often confused with a missed abortion. You're not going to have any fetal heart activity, uh, but the os is going to be closed and she's going to think she's pregnant, but it's a it's a, uh, a dead fetus. Um, so that's why it gets confused with missed abortion. What's going to help you is that the beta HCG is going to be high. And uh, ultimately, we're going to manage this the exact same way as far as uh, expectant management or medical management, uh, depending on her preferences. Many times, these will miscarry on their own. Now, if you have a complete hydatidiform mole, if that's what's diagnosed and you know it because you've got the snowstorm appearance and all that, you must get a chest x-ray to look for metastasis. These can be cancerous. So you'll need to get a chest x-ray at this point. And with either of these, and this goes for any uh, abortion or, uh, or ectopic pregnancy, you need to get serial beta HCGs until they normalize. And this is all the more important with a complete mole because beta HCG is basically your tumor marker. So if that does not normalize, we need to consider the fact that we're now dealing with gestational, trophobl tr gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. All right, this is the snowstorm appearance that you would see. Notice uh, you've got these hydropic villi that you can see here. Now, the management, please keep in mind that if you're ever dealing with somebody that's hemodynamically unstable, your first step is going to be to fluid resuscitate them. With threatened abortion, because this is not a miscarriage yet, uh, we're going to follow them up with a repeat sonogram and a beta HCG. Um, now, some sources say 7 to 10 days, some say 4 to 7 days. This is just what I found. You don't need to worry about that. Just know that you need to follow them up with a beta HCG. We expect it to rise. And with a sonogram, we expect it to progress. These patients should also get Rogam. They're bleeding. So we want to make sure we're not getting alloimmunization. 
Inevitable, incomplete, and missed abortions, uh, it really is variable how we manage this. It's up to the woman. As long as she's not hemodynamically compromised, we can manage this expectantly, or we can speed nature along a little bit by doing misoprostol or just evacuating the uterus. Again, you need to repeat, uh, particularly beta-HCG, and uh, ideally a sonogram because occasionally uh, there may be retained products of conception. A complete abortion, you don't really need to do anything, just reassure and give Rogam. Ectopic pregnancy, it's very complicated how this is managed. What you do need to know, however, um, is that if she is unstable, you need to do surgical management. If you do medical management, it's with methotrexate. And then a molar pregnancy, we always uh, evacuate this, and then we get serial beta-HCG levels, as we just mentioned. This is a way that you can visualize uh, threatened, inevitable, complete, and incomplete abortions. Uh, so you need to know whether there's passage of fetal tissue and whether the cervical os is opened or closed. And then the uh, missed abortion, the thing that stands out with that is that there's no bleeding, no passage of tissue, all you have is a dead fetus and a closed os. Complications, of course, pregnancy loss, heavy bleeding, retained products of conception, as mentioned, endometritis, typically a result of, um, of a surgical uh, through surgery, uh, then a septic abortion, and uh, if you have a threatened abortion, there is an increased risk of complications later on in pregnancy and in subsequent pregnancies. So to recap, the most important steps that you need to do, make sure you give fluids if they're, un, uh, uh, if they're unstable. You need to make sure you do your good physical exam with a speculum and uh, visualize that os. Get a quantitative beta-HCG, a CBC, and a transvaginal ultrasound. The beta-HCG, the uh, os, and the transvaginal ultrasound will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Know the difference between threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, and missed, because it does get asked. Miscarriage can typically be managed expectantly, depending on various factors, including the beta-HCG levels and the size of the fetus. The preferred medical management uh, for a spontaneous abortion is misoprostol, uh, but for an ectopic pregnancy, it's methotrexate. Surgical management for a spontaneous abortion would be DNC. Uh, for an ectopic pregnancy, because it's not in the uterus, we have to get to the fallopian tubes, and so it would be selpingostomy or selpingectomy. We follow these patients up with beta-HCG levels until they normalize, and we give Rogam to all RH-negative women with threatened abortions, spontaneous abortions, and ectopic pregnancies.